All right, guys, we're continuing on through our series through the book of Acts titled Christ's Hands and Feet. Last week, we discussed the coming of the Holy Spirit, how we filled every believer, unlike in Old Testament times, how he would come upon a certain person at a certain time for a specific duty. Now, every disciple is filled with the Spirit. That means you and I, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And it was described as coming upon them like tongues like fire, fire above people's heads. That imagery is weird. Just imagine like a little fire emoji above their heads. It was the coming in of the Holy Spirit. This was an outward expression of what was happening inwardly. You see, the Holy Spirit is the living God in us. And now we are going to dive into the disciple Peter sermon after the Spirit had been filled in the church. We are going from fire to inspired. This is out of Acts chapter 2, verses 40, I'm sorry, verses 14 to 41, and this is the word of God. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. And this happened, he's saying this because in verse 13, some, however, made fun of them, said they had too much wine. It was because everyone was speaking the same native tongue, though they were from different nations. So there was some confusion. Peter's like, that's not how it is. That's not what's happening. Continuing on, these people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Come on. <laughs> now this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, meaning they will speak on behalf of God, speak the heart of God to the people. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. Glorious meaning beautiful. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter continues. That was from the prophet Joel. Now these are his own words. Peter of Israel, people of Israel, Peter of Israel, people of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, Put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. That line is so killer. It was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, and here's another excerpt from the Old Testament. David wrote, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Peter continues, Brothers and sisters, we all know that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him an, on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne, that being Jesus. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of death, nor did his body see decay. God raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you see and hear. He's like, right now, this is from that guy. This is from Jesus. This is a direct result of the work of Christ. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, and here's another quote from David from the Old Testament, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. 
Peter continues, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, here's their reaction. They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, and here's the big thing, guys. This is the response to the gospel. Repent. Come on, wind. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. All who are far off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Iconic sermon. One of the most iconic, simple sermons ever. And people were cut to the heart ready for change. We see 3,000 people give their lives that day. That's crazy. Don't just read over that. It's not 30 people. It's not 300 people. It is 3,000 people gave their lives to Jesus that day. And there's no amplification. Peter wasn't speaking into a microphone. There was no mics, nothing fancy. Peter didn't even have an iPad giveaway for coming to the event. He just had some really good news. And that's what the gospel is. It is good news. And that's what we're all looking for. That's what the whole world is looking for. Some real, tangible, good news. No counterfeit. That will not work. Only the gospel of Jesus can satisfy humanity's innate desire to be whole. And there can only be one response to the gospel. Peter says it. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for your forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And with many other words, he warned them, he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Let's dive into those implications. Let's dive into the response of receiving the gospel. First one is this, repent which is not a simple apology. It's not just apologizing, that is not repenting, but rather you turn a full 180 from the direction in which you are going. But why? Why should they need to repent if Jesus already saved them from hell and they're gonna get into heaven by his saving grace? Isn't that all there is to it? No, here's two, two reasons why. First one is this, heaven is to be experienced today through spending time with God and welcoming Jesus into every part of your life. That's one, and that's really sick. Number two, sin is toxic. See, sin is the reason why death is a thing. It eats away at your humanity. So there's a reason why Christ went to the extent of dying on the cross to put sin to death. He wanted to take away its power, and he wanted to give an opportunity for his kids to not be burdened by it. Now, I must note that repenting doesn't make life easier. You hear that? Repenting doesn't make life easier, for life is hard whether you're a Christian or not. That's just the case. But instead, it gives a greater posture for a Christian's life. You see, repenting from sin is posturing yourself for God's goodness. Keep that word in mind, posture. You see, when I first became a bar back at True Food Kitchen, a bougie health food restaurant, when I first became a bar back there, bartender's assistant, in 2013, I messed up my back big time. Like two weeks in, I was already at a masseuse, getting my back massaged, getting adjusted and all such things. Why? Because of my posture. I didn't bend my knees. I didn't keep my back straight. I just bent over and picked up and I was like, oh no, why do I feel like I'm 80 immediately? I went from bar back to bad back real quick. And now when I properly learn how to lift heavy objects, never hurt my back. Things were still really heavy, but I was able to manage it well. And I even grew in strength because of it, enduring heaviness even more so over time. 
And likewise, the same with our walks with Jesus, walking in holiness, it's all about the posture in life. When we repent from sinful nature and when we walk in a way that honors God, excuse me, from that we grow in strength and in endurance. So we are not crushed by the heaviness of life. We posture ourselves for holiness rather than fall into sin and experience backlash as a result or backache as a result. That is the first response to receiving the gospel. Second is this, be baptized. An important note, baptism does not cleanse you. Jesus cleanses you. Rather, it is a public de declaration of faith. So if you're a Christian and you haven't been baptized, get baptized. With baptism, cool thing, we identify with the death and resurrection of Christ. As we go under the water, we identify with the death of Christ. And as we rise from the water, we identify with his resurrection, his rising from the grave. And with it, we publicly de declare to those around us that we are disciples of Jesus, redeemed by his grace. And with that, those around us, they are our witnesses who hold us accountable. They're all your accountability partners with walking out your faith, which is super important. This is so crucial, my friends, because walking with Jesus is a corporate thing, not an individual thing. You see, we are the church. We don't simply go to church. That's the next response. We get baptized. And then what happens when we receive Christ as our Savior? We receive the Holy Spirit. And I went into a lot of cool implications of receiving the Holy Spirit last week, making sure you knew who he was, making sure he's not the holy who to you. He is the Holy Spirit. He is part of the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three in one, and he desires to move in you and through you. So if you haven't already watched last week's message, watch it after this and learn all the cool implications of walking with the Holy Spirit, with him living within you and what he intends to do. But for now, we receive the Holy Spirit through the grace given us by Christ. And the Spirit enables us to live our lives as kingdom builders, as advancers of God's kingdom, aka doing good in Jesus' name and loving people really well. Jesus told his disciples this, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So go and live it out as the spirit enables you, as the spirit moves through you. You see, we receive the Holy Spirit by salvation by Christ. Not anything we ourselves did nor could do, it is just by the grace of Christ. And that is the sickest news. Last one. Peter says this, save yourselves from what is corrupt in this generation. You see, things were corrupt then, and they are corrupt now. Truthfully, they were corrupt right after the first sin. Adam and Eve ate the apple, then Cain killed his brother Abel. Things escalated way too quickly. The world is obviously broken. Something is not right. Clearly, look around you. Something's just not right. So as disciples of Jesus, our response to the grace we have been shown is to live consistently with Christ's grace. And this happens through all the things that we talked about in this message, that when we repent, we turn from sin and posture ourselves for holiness. When we get baptized, we publicly declare our faith and live consistent with it. And when we receive the Holy Spirit, as he enables us to do good in Jesus' name, and as we love people really well, we will then be saving ourselves from this corrupt world by living different, by living like Christ, by living set apart. And just as importantly as saving ourselves, we'll save this corrupt world. We'll save our friends and our family. We'll save those who aren't walking with Jesus by living different, by living like Christ. So both live in a way that stands out for yourself and live in such a way that stands out for the sake of loving and saving others. You see, this message brought to us by Peter brought 3,000 people to the faith. It's pretty simple, and that's because it is the simple gospel. 
Christ came to save. Grace is free and available to you. And now that you have received it, live consistent with it and welcome others into it by doing good in Jesus' name and loving people really well as we are Christ's hands and feet. God bless you, brothers and sisters.